Today, we're delighted to welcome back to the FCC Professor Charlie Jeffrey, uh, the Senior Vice Principal uh, and the Chair of Politics at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, as so many of you will remember, uh, Professor Jeffrey spoke here last year immediately after the Scottish referendum, and today he is going to talk to us about what was the most unpredictable election in living memory. Uh, well, that's what all the pollsters said it was going to be, um, with the outcome, um, judging by the uh, enthusiastic reception down in the main bar at breakfast on election day, uh, suggested that a lot of people in Hong Kong were reasonably comfortable with the result. <laughs> so, I'm delighted to hand over to, uh, to Charlie, who will bring us up to date on UK politics. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Tim. It's, uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to be introduced by an alumnus of, of the University of Edinburgh, uh, and uh, it's nice to welcome other alumni who, uh, who are also uh, here, uh, as well as, uh, more generally, the members of, of the club. Um, I have my tie on, so I'm, I'm demonstrating that it, it is my, my second uh, appearance. It's great to be back here. Uh, one brief apology in advance. Uh, I, I had a, an unexpectedly long time last night in Hangzhou Airport, um, where I was putting the final touches to this presentation. And there were many absences in Hangzhou Airport, which you notice when you're there for five or six hours longer than you intended to be. Um, things like flight delay announcements, food concessions, uh, and working internet connections. Um, so one, of, one or two of my slides are a bit flakier than uh, I would normally like them to be. So apologies for that. So yes, it, it was uh, an extraordinary uh, election um, with uh, a, a quite unexpected outcome. Here it is. Um, we have uh, an overall majority for the Conservative Party, a triumph for David Cameron. Uh, no uh, sitting Prime Minister has both increased share of vote and seats for decades. Uh, not by much, as you can see, just a marginal increase in vote. Uh, not that many more seats. Uh, Labour also went up a bit, but uh, lost out in terms uh, of seats. Uh, not least because of its decimation in Scotland at the hands of the SNP. You see that plus 50 figure there against the SNP, which is uh, quite extraordinary. Just below it, you see something else extraordinary, which is the minus 49 uh, for the Liberal Democrats, utterly uh, decimated uh, across the UK. You can see that the Greens increased uh, their vote. This is, these are the UK-wide results. I'll, I'll show you Scotland's uh, in, a, in a moment specifically, and England's uh, uh, later on too. So UK-wide, the Greens uh, increased their vote a bit, but no more seats. Uh, UKIP uh, had a, a pretty notable result, 12.6%. That's almost 4 million uh, voters for the UK Independence Party, now the third party by popular support, uh, but only one seat. They actually had over 120 second places, uh, which were pretty evenly spread uh, around England, uh, north and south, and extending into Wales. Uh, you might say that if UKIP was a party of uh, stability and good organisation, um, it could be around for some time, but I suspect it's probably neither of those things. Uh, modest change in Wales and Northern Ireland, so I'm not going to talk about uh, them. I will talk about uh, Scotland, though. Uh, an extraordinary result. These are the Scotland-only uh, results, where you see, again, uh, that SNP uh, uh, astonishing victory. Plus 50. 56 out of 59 seats. That's 95% uh, of seats uh, in Scotland. We have a, a, a peculiar... <coughs> form of political measurement uh, in Scotland, uh, which has to do with the fact that these uh, lovely two pandas now reside in Edinburgh Zoo. Uh, we measure political parties against uh, the total of pandas 
uh, in Scotland. Uh, and we now have three political parties uh, with fewer MPs than pandas uh, in Scotland. Uh, that's, that's David Mundell, um, the Conservative Party's sole representative uh, in Scotland. Ian Murray, he's my MP, Edinburgh South, Labour's last remaining representative uh, in Scotland, uh, the, the last of the 41 that Labour had. Uh, and here is Alistair Carmichael, um, clearly metaphorically shooting himself uh, uh, in his dismay at being the last Liberal Democrat uh, standing uh, in Scotland. So Labour minus 40, SNP plus 50, the SNP was about 5,000 votes across Scotland short of an absolute queen, clean uh, sweep. The national swing to the, to the SNP was 24%, an absolute record, nothing like that in history. Uh, and we had a, 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 an interesting uh, evening looking at constituency level swings. I was on BBC Scotland all night uh, and uh, talking early on in the evening when one of the first Scottish results came through. It was, uh, it was an 18% swing to the SNP in Kilmarnock. So there was a discussion about what would be the record swing ever at constituency level. I looked it up, it was 21.8%. That got beaten a few minutes later, and it got beaten, and it got beaten, and it got beaten until it broke that fantastic British election institution, the swingometer. Now here is the biggest swing. Uh, in Glasgow Northeast, it required actually a 26% swing to the SNP to take it from Labour. They got 39.3, and you can see that the BBC's graphic could not accommodate a swing uh, that big. So the 39 is is concealed by the uh, the scale of the swing. So an election that broke the swingometer. So extraordinary in Scotland, uh, pretty extraordinary in England. Uh, as well. Uh, what you see here are the England uh, only uh, results. Uh, you can see that the Conservative Party uh, has 319 out of 533 seats, 60% uh, of England's uh, seats, uh, so a clear majority party uh, in England. And you can see here that, that Labour did really rather disappointingly uh, across England. A, a very small recovery from uh, one of its worst ever results in England uh, in, uh, in 2010. Now there was a lot of recrimination uh, in, in the Labour Party about how Scotland had lost it for the party. That's nonsense. Labour lost this election above all because it was unable to uh, win sufficient support in England. Those of you who have been uh, around uh, for a while will remember uh, Tony Blair's first landslide in 1997. One of the iconic moments uh, was the defeat of Michael Portillo uh, in uh, Enfield Southgate. Uh, and one of the slogans of that election was, were you still up for Portillo? Well, this time it's, were you still up for Ed Balls? Uh, here you can see him being uh, uh, declared the loser uh, in, in Morley, uh, in, in Leeds, uh, at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, Ed Ball's defeat is, is a confirmation that Labour lost that election in England. One of the remarkable things about how the Conservatives played the election was that they had an English campaign for the first time. Uh, they presented themselves specifically in England as an English uh, party. Uh, they promised to introduce English votes on English laws, known by its acronym of EVIL. Um, that is to produce special procedures in the House of Commons to deal with England-only business. As part of that, they would have an English rate of income tax. They announced an English manifesto uh, during the campaign. They didn't write it down anywhere, but they just said this is an English manifesto. Uh, which included something called the Carlyle Principle, which would be an annual uh, statement of all the damaging things the Scottish Parliament had done with consequences for England. Uh, in other words, they were uh, presenting themselves as the defenders of England, in particular against Scotland. And we saw imagery such as this, 
Uh, this is Nicola Sturgeon, the, uh, the Scottish First Minister, with an Ed Miliband puppet, and uh, rather famously, uh, we had uh, uh, Alex Salmon with Ed Miliband in his uh, jacket uh, pocket. You might say uh, that this election has outed the Conservative Party as England's national party, uh, now ranged against Scotland's uh, national party. One of the big questions will be how those two national parties will work uh, together. This was uh, an unexpected uh, outcome. Uh, the opinion polls had predicted a neck and neck outcome uh, between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. Uh, apologies for the fuzziness uh, of this. This is all the election, uh, all the opinion polls um, back to the last election. So lots and lots of data points. But you can see that the, the fuzzy red line and the fuzzy blue line were pretty much neck and neck uh, as the election approached. And if you can read the numbers, it had the Conservatives ahead of Labour by 0.6 of 1%, 34.7 to 34.1. They actually came out in the lead by 6%. Uh, All of the expectations beforehand had been of a Labour-led government under Ed Miliband, supported by the SNP and perhaps others. Um, this was way wrong. And here's an example. Uh, this is uh, a projection produced by um, uh, very clever political scientists at the University of Oxford who uh, got it wrong. Um, wouldn't find political scientists at the University of Edinburgh doing things like this. Uh, this, is, this is their projection of the possibilities of government formation published on the day of the election. This is their forecast. Labour Prime Minister, well, there's a 58% probability of a Labour Prime Minister working with the SNP and perhaps others. And you can see um, just at about uh, between 12 and 1 o'clock the likelihood of a Conservative majority at 6%. Whoops. However, the polling did get Scotland right. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the outcome of the, the very final poll of polls, the average of the last sequence of opinion polls in Scotland uh, on uh, the 7th of May, and you can see that it got the SNP at 49, where they scored 50, uh, slightly over for, for Labour, slightly under for the Lib Dems, bang on uh, for the Conservatives. So the polls were absolutely spot on in Scotland. Nobody believed them, though, uh, and they were wrong in England, and everybody believed them. Uh, what we have now is an independent ex investigation being carried out uh, about why uh, the polls were so wrong. I'm sure there are plenty of newspapers which are very annoyed about having paid so much money uh, for them to be carried out. But there may be a, a sense that the, the flawed polling uh, shaped the debate and how people voted. If it had shown the Conservatives in the lead, then we might have had a different debate and people might have had different calculations about how they would cast uh, their uh, vote. So the pollsters are indeed, I think, in for a bit of a kicking. Uh, what does it all mean? Well, I think four themes for me, um, as set out on that slide, losers in turmoil, um, issues around public spending, Scotland uh, and uh, Europe. First of all, the losers in turmoil. Uh, we had a game of dominoes uh, on the 8th of May. Um, here we have uh, Ed Miliband going uh, at 12.16. Uh, uh, um, I've got this in slightly the wrong sequence because Nick Clegg had beaten him to it uh, at 11.34. Uh, uh, and then 11.25, uh, oh, I'm going completely the wrong direction, Nigel Farage. Uh, resigned uh, as head of UKIP. Uh, I mentioned earlier um, some of the features of, of UKIP as a party which lacks a certain coherence, and it was confirmed when he unresigned uh, shortly, uh, shortly afterwards. Um, but, but UKIP also uh, in some turmoil. Uh, most of the attention, I think, is, is on Labour as, as Labour gears up for a, a six-month uh, leadership 
uh, campaign, the, the various contestants setting out their stalls. One of them, the first to declare, is already undeclared. Um, it, it, it looks like a, a long, hard uh, summer. Uh, also for Labour in Scotland, because um, uh, Jim Murphy, the Scottish Labour leader, has also at least announced his intention uh, to resign very grudgingly and in a very public dispute with uh, some of the trade unions who fund the Labour Party. So, turmoil, what does that mean? Well, I, I think it means that the Conservatives are in an unexpectedly strong position for a party which has such a slim overall majority. The opposition isn't going to be doing much opposing uh, in the coming months because they're going to be working out what the hell they are going to do as political parties, with one exception, uh, and that is the SNP. The SNP, the, the third biggest party uh, at Westminster, uh, I, I am pretty sure that that is the party from which the most vigorous opposition to the Conservatives is going to come, uh, at least for the first couple of years uh, of this Parliament. And given that strength, uh, they will be represented on, on all of the uh, House of Commons uh, committees. They will be second up after Labour every week at Prime Minister's questions. They are a fearsomely disciplined party. They will use those opportunities with uh, great creativity and persistence. Uh, my second, second theme to think about is uh, spending. Um, this was an election in which we had uh, the clearest choice on fiscal policy since the 1980s. Here you see spending plans by party as calculated by the Institute of Fiscal Studies. You can see the Conservatives wish to push spending down to about 36% uh, of national uh, income, public spending down to 36%. All of the other parties were higher than that. The Conservatives want to get the deficit to zero in four years. They intend to do so while keeping tax revenues stable as a percent of GDP. Uh, in fact, they gave various assurances that they would not increase income tax, national insurance, or VAT. That means they're going to cut spending, uh, and their plan is to cut it to that level, which is a historically low level. They're going to do that while protecting spending in some fields, international aid, it's not very much, um, schools, that's a lot, and health, that's enormous. All of those areas are protected. They claim they're going to get five billion uh, a year from cracking down on tax avoidance. They haven't shown much success in that area uh, in the past. Uh, and they claim they're going to whack on another 12 billion uh, in cuts in social security one-tenth of which has been identified so far, and the biggest item in the Social Security budget, that is pensions, is also protected. Uh, that means that everything else is going to get cut back pretty uh, substantially. Uh, and for those benefits in the unprotected category, they will be, if those plans are carried out, back to levels last seen in 1990, 25 years ago. All of that is underpinned by quite optimistic assumptions about economic growth at 2.5%. Uh, um, let's see if we achieve uh, that. Uh, I think this is going to be difficult to deliver. Uh, if it is delivered, it will be very uh, contentious. Uh, there will be uh, losers. The losers will squeal. Conservative backbenchers who feel those squeals will get restive. It could get uh, messy. Scotland. Well, the SNP went into the election expecting to be able to exert leverage over a Labour minority government. They believe the polls as well. They had three big claims. One was to increase spending. You can see them at a, a rather higher level uh, there on that chart. They wanted to cancel the renewal of Trident, the nuclear weapons system, and they wanted more powers uh, for the Scottish Parliament. They were clear that this was not an election about a new referendum. Nicola Sturgeon said on various occasions that material change would be needed before we could think about another referendum. Uh, not exactly clear what material change means, but I'll come to an example uh, later on. But for now, 
um, the SNP has no leverage on two of those three big ambitions. No leverage on spending. The Conservatives have a majority. They will try to pursue that spending plan as set out on that chart. Uh, and there's no leverage on Trident uh, either. Uh, the Conservatives, plus a big chunk of the Labour Party, will uh, support the renewal of Trident. The SNP has 56 out of 650. They can't stop it. What they can do is to press for more powers for the Scottish Parliament. Here you see a picture of Lord Smith, who convened uh, a commission after the referendum, which brought together political parties, including the SNP, and with it a proposal uh, to increase especially the tax and welfare powers uh, of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon will now seek to push David Cameron beyond uh, that uh, agreement. And there is a real possibility of a deal between the two national parties. Uh, there is a possibility of a deal. You know, give Scotland more. As part of that, you begin to institutionalise England in the UK political system through English votes on English laws, where the Conservative Party is the, uh, the dominant uh, party. You could get a, a bargain together there, not least because both marginalise the common enemy, which is uh, Labour. So your enemy's enemy is your friend. There, there should be, if people are creative, the basis of a deal. Uh, we'll see. Uh, one of the things that could throw that off, though, is um, Europe. Uh, David Cameron has committed to an EU referendum, which we may see uh, as early as May next year. Uh, they'd originally thought 2017, but uh, Germany and France have elections in that year, and I think uh, Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande have said, don't have your referendum then. Uh, that wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, in addition, it is a slim majority, and I think Cameron will want to move on this while there is still a rosy memory of his victory and before an austerity government saps party uh, discipline. Remember, the Conservatives are not a united party on Europe. Uh, many MPs and many Conservative voters would like to be out of the EU in all circumstances. So I think Cameron will try to move quickly while he still has the authority of his victory behind him. And with those nearly four million votes uh, for UKIP uh, firmly in his uh, mind. UKIP, a party committed unconditionally uh, to uh, withdrawal and pressing the Conservative Party um, to uh, take a strong line on Europe. Is anything more than a cosmetic renegotiation of terms possible? Um, I doubt it. I, I doubt there will be great openness among other uh, member states uh, for reforms which perhaps, uh, as Cameron has suggested he would like, would uh, um, undermine the principle of free movement uh, of labour. Uh, and I suspect Cameron will probably see a pretty strong business mobilisation against withdrawal from the EU, which will make things somewhat difficult uh, for him. What do the Brits think about all of this? Uh, well, here's what the English think. This is from a survey I did with colleagues uh, last year, which showed that the English just about... Uh, were in favour of, of coming out. And you could see how that works across the party political spectrum, with the Lib Dem, Lib Dem supporters and Labour supporters clearly for remaining in, and Conservative and UKIP supporters clearly uh, for being out. David Cameron has got um, uh, an electorate to respond to here, which he's going to find quite challenging. What may be as or more challenging is the fact that Europe divides by nation as well. These were the figures we got in April last year. Uh, we hope to do some more uh, before summer this year. But showing that Scotland has a clearly different viewpoint uh, on Europe uh, than people in England and indeed uh, Wales. Now, if you, if you had a referendum which had a voting pattern like that, UK-wide, it would be close to 50-50, uh, and it could put Scotland and England on different sides uh, of the outcome. Uh, and that is, I think, the most likely source of the material change of which Nicola Sturgeon has spoken, which could open up a possibility of another uh, Scottish uh, referendum. 
So to sum up, uh, what does it all mean? Well, um, the second, third and fourth biggest parties are going to be spending lots of time in the coming months working out what to do and who should lead them uh, wherever that uh, should go. Uh, they're going to be thinking about themselves, they're not going to be thinking about the UK. We're going to have a big debate on public spending, public spending cuts, who loses, how the burdens are distributed. Will this lead to public sector strikes, more controversies around things like the bedroom tax? Well, yes, probably. Uh, thirdly, we're going to have a continuing debate about how the Scots should govern themselves, probably with a sub-debate about how England should govern itself. And we're going to have renewed debate about how the UK should govern itself in its European context. All of those things, I think, turn us inward. Now, when was the last significant contribution by UK government or opposition to addressing a major international issue? Greece and uh, the future of the Eurozone, uh, refugee crisis in Mediterranean, Ukraine, Syria, North Africa, climate change. Uh, I can't remember one. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the image which follows probably sums up uh, UK politics over the next uh, five years. We are in for a prolonged bout of naval gazing. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, we now throw the floor open to questions. If you'd like to raise your hand, we'll uh, get a microphone to you. Uh, and if you could just identify yourself, and then we'll get on with it. Over here. Hello, my name's Alison Cook. Um, does this also raise the question of electoral reform at all in the UK? Uh, yes. Um, the, the, the problem is uh, that those, uh, the, the advocates of electoral reform are not normally those who have won a majority uh, in the parliament uh, and who have the means to legislate for electoral reform. Um, but we, we have seen um, some fairly crass outcomes. Um, the SNP is clearly overrepresented. 50% you know, of the vote, tremendous achievement, but 95% of the seats. Uh, UKIP nearly 13% of the vote, one out of 650, the Liberal Democrats also uh, underrepresented. Um, it, it is a system, an electoral system, which does not produce anything like a, a, an outcome proportional to how people vote. Um, and that normally gets complained about by those who lose elections who can't do anything about it. And that's where we are. <coughs> Hello, my name is Sally Johnson. I just wanted to ask you, and particularly that you were watching this from Scotland. Um, during the election campaign, Ed Miliband was forced, first of all, into making some austerity measures of his own with his Edstone. And second, he was forced to say that he wouldn't make a pact with the SNP. What's your assessment? How many of those SNP votes are actually nationalist votes? Or how many of them are left-wing Labour votes or anti English Labour Party votes. Are they real nationalists, do you think? Um, I, I, there's a number of levels on which to answer that. I, I don't think you can read that vote as <coughs> uh, a vote about Scotland's constitutional position uh, within the UK in respect to independence. I think there are a lot of people who voted Labour who are not instinctive uh, independence uh, supporters. I think the SNP Sorry, I beg your pardon, yes. Um, <clears throat> I think the SNP uh, worked very hard with, uh, with a, a rhetoric about social justice uh, and maintaining public spending at a higher level to, to protect public services, which was very much focused on keeping close to them uh, people in the west of Scotland who had voted yes uh, last year, but who had traditionally voted uh, Labour. Uh, I think the... Uh, the scale of, of their success is, is above all about having a strong voice at Westminster. And the scale of Labour's defeat is a sense among Scots that Labour is incapable of uh, providing that voice. And I think that was underlined by uh, Ed Miliband's evident lack of resonance at all uh, in uh, Scotland. 
Uh, I don't think Miliband uh, sought to learn about Scotland uh, very much. He certainly didn't understand Scotland, and he didn't understand the differential challenge that the Labour Party has in Scotland, where the Conservatives are not the opponents. The SNP are the opponents. Uh, and Labour will need to realise that if it is to recover uh, in Scotland. <coughs> Hi, um, Alistair Hetherington. Um, what, what, does, what does David Cameron think about Europe? Does he want to be in or out? Or does he just want a solution that gets him re-elected for a third term? And um, can the SNP sustain this level of, of share of vote going into the next general election? David Cameron has been clear that he would like the UK to stay in the EU. Um, he would like to have something he can call a renegotiation. Uh, it may not be that far-reaching a, a renegotiation, but will certainly be puffed up into, into something rather more significant than it is. Uh, I think the problem for Cameron is that he has been a prisoner of the European issue rather than leading it right from the time when he contested the Conservative Party leadership uh, back in uh, the mid-2000s. Uh, where in order to uh, head off uh, the challenge of David Davis, in particular from the right of the Conservative Party, he made pledges on Europe, which were not really his beliefs, but a, a, a tactical positioning. To an extent, he's been a prisoner of that tactical positioning uh, ever since, and he still is now, which is why he has to go forward with uh, a referendum in which he doesn't really believe, um, but needs to have in order to maintain the unity of his party. Uh, he will campaign uh, to stay in. Uh, his party may well um, uh, have a, a very difficult time in retaining a united voice uh, when that moment comes. SNP, um, the SNP's strength uh, partly reflects that sense that it is going to be a far better defender of Scotland's interests in the UK than anyone else. It partly reflects uh, a very, very skillful leadership renewal uh, from Salmond, uh, who resigned the day after the referendum, to Sturgeon, who's given, uh, given the party a, a, new, uh, a, a new launch, as it were, under her leadership, and she's been tremendously effective. Uh, it, what it will take for the SNP to be knocked off that position is, is change on both of those things, a sense that others, most likely the Labour Party, can defend Scotland's interests within the UK, which would mean a much more devolved or even independent Labour Party uh, in Scotland, and they'll need to find a compelling leader. Uh, and they've, they've gone through a few and they haven't found one yet. Uh, Nigel Sharman, what is the nature of the deal that could be done between um, David Cameron and the Scottish Nationalists, given that the last thing the SNP probably wants right now is full fiscal autonomy? Yes, um, full fiscal autonomy has receded from the, the urgent list of priorities for the SNP. Um, that uh, receding process has a direct correlation to the price of oil, um, I, I think. Uh, what, I, what I think the SNP would like is um, a, a bigger increment, a bigger incremental move towards a stronger Scottish Parliament than is set out in, in the Smith's Commission report with additional powers uh, over taxation, possibly quite significantly additional, but with continuing uh, transfers from the UK level uh, to Scotland. Uh, full fiscal autonomy is now seen as, as a, 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 at the very least, a medium-term uh, initiative which will need to be uh, smoothed by continuing integration into the system of UK fiscal transfers, uh, otherwise known as having your cake and eating it. Um, now, that's, that's still a deal uh, which could be acceptable to the Conservatives if they 
if they really wish to institutionalize England in a way uh, it has not been institutionalized in the UK political system through English votes on English laws. That is, is something which is extraordinarily complex. It's not simply a matter of tweaking parliamentary procedure. I think you have to think uh, more fundamentally about how you do government business. And you have to think about England as a territorial unit. You have to organize your ministries uh, in that way. You have to think about how you fund public policies in a much more systematic territorial basis. And you probably have to have a proper manifesto actually written down with a full raft of policies uh, as compared to the thing that the Conservatives talked about in that election. But if you did that, you're likely to produce a political unit, England, in which the Conservatives have, for the foreseeable future, an inherent advantage. So there is a deal there, uh, institutionalizing that advantage for the Conservatives while continuing to, to, to fund Scotland as its powers get enhanced. Um, I could see that deal, and I, I went to a Conservative Party conference it's probably about seven or eight years ago now, um, suggesting to them that that was uh, an obvious thing for them to be thinking about. Um, I don't think they've, they've shown the creativity of thought yet. Perhaps now is the time. Thank you. Uh, John Binks. Um, do you think that David Cameron's going to come to regret the passing of the Fixed Term Parliament Act? Um, that, that was a, a really big issue had there not been an absolute majority um, because it, it, it could have been difficult to construct a stable arrangement without uh, an overall majority for any one political party and the act could then have been a, a, an obstacle to, to moving forward with perhaps a new election. Uh, Cameron may come to regret that because his lead is, n is not a big one. Um, somebody will be awkward enough to die uh, and cause a, a by-election uh, and cuts will begin to bite and you'll get an anti-conservative protest and Europe might um, produce a few uh, rebels who refuse to support. So a, a couple of years in, uh, that majority may no longer in effect exist. Uh, and what Cameron would need in those circumstances to call a new election is a two-thirds majority uh, in Parliament. In other words, Labour would need to vote with the Conservatives. Now, if I were, whoever it is, Andy Burnham perhaps, seeing a Conservative Party struggling with itself uh, on Europe and other matters, would I consent to an election or would I string it out? Well, I think I know what I would do. Gavin Ewer, uh, I believe that uh, during the election, the other parties in Scotland, apart from the SNP, were frustrated that any criticisms they levied against the SNP as the government in Scotland seemed to have no effect upon voters at all. Is that likely to change as we lead up to the Holyrood elections next year, where this might be more relevant? Um, you're, you're very right. Um, there, there, there is a sense that the SNP has got away with uh, a number of public policy failings. Um, for example, outcomes on, on education uh, are, are not improving. Uh, you could look at all sorts of health outcome indicators and say that things are not improving. Uh, reforms to the organization of the police have proved uh, unpopular. Uh, so all sorts of, uh, of issues of record on which the SNP could be challenged uh, and indeed parties were saying it's very unfair that people are, uh, are not recognizing this. Do we blame the SNP for that or do we blame those parties uh, for that? Uh, what's been striking about the Scottish Parliament in the last few years is how ineffective the opposition has been. Uh, how the opposition parties have not been at all creative in using the parliament as a platform for opposition, doing creative things with parliamentary procedure. Their heart's not been in it. 
uh, and that's given the SNP a very easy ride. And I think the SNP will continue to have a very easy ride until those opposition parties uh, start doing some proper opposing. And, and I have to say the Labour Party in Scotland, as well as at the UK level, is going to be consumed for, for the next period in its own leadership battle, and it's probably not going to be doing any of that. So in the run-up to the next election, I think the SNP could have a continuation of that easy ride. Uh, Nick Thompson, no affiliation. Do you think the damage caused by the referendum uh, can ever be repaired? Or if you think it can be repaired, how many years will that take? I certainly felt a feeling when I was in Scotland last year of almost a hatred for the English. And then on the English side, almost coming out and thinking, Scotland don't like us, why should we bother with Scotland? And by the way, my mother's Scottish, my father's English. I'm an Englishman in Scotland. Yeah. Um, the, the referendum created a yes-no situation where people didn't think themselves to be in a yes-no position. Uh, I, think, I think there is uh, a, a wider spectrum of views than independence or not. Uh, I think there's probably a, a very clear majority in Scotland for a parliament that is significantly stronger than the one we have, but which is within uh, the UK. But that wasn't uh, an option uh, last year. So I think people were forced into, uh, a, a, in a sense, an artificial polarisation. Uh, and, and that left quite a few bruises uh, in Scotland. Uh, and I think elsewhere in the UK, especially in England, perhaps most especially in, uh, amongst uh, those of Scottish heritage uh, in, uh, in England who, who didn't feel that they were given a stake in, in what for them was a quite fundamental issue. Um, I don't think the issues have been resolved. Uh, the, the Scottish constitutional question is still live and it will still have, it will continue to have uh, reverberations uh, there's a challenge of, uh, of statesmanship there, I guess, uh, which uh, Prime Minister Cameron and First Minister Sturgeon have an opportunity to address. Um, let's see if they take it. Thank you very much. Uh, Charlie, thank you for uh, another illuminating conversation. Um, you've got your tie, so you'll continue... <laughs> Depletion of the FCC's inventory. Absolutely. Uh, we'd like to present you with some of our correspondence there. Thank, thank you, you very much. Very much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again back at the FCC soon. Thank you. Well,